This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much, uh, first of all, for inviting me, Mike. That, that's a real pleasure. I've, this is the third time I've been here. I've been here when I was a PhD candidate, visiting George Dunder, Dr. George Dunder, and then um, visiting in my postdoc, and, and now, so that, that's always nice. All right, so get to it. We have a lot of things. We, I want to talk to you about them. Um, and as Mike said, there will be Arabidopsis in my slides, but I hope I'm going to convince you that uh, in the traits that we're looking at, it's um, translatable, and we really want to learn about concepts. So let's just get to it. Um, so I'm going to so I'm going to talk about the uh, how we are trying to uncover metabolic and genetic uh, regulation of free and bound amino acids in seeds. I think here it's really easy to understand why we're doing that. We're eating seeds. Um, we're actually eating a lot of types of seed, but not all seeds are born equal, as was mentioned here. Um, about 70%, up to 70% of human food consumption can be uh, basically achieved from rice, corn, and wheat. And those are great as carbohydrate source, but they're a very poor source of protein. I know some of you really want to delete all the protein, but we're not going to name names. Um, <laughs> But I beg to differ, okay? <laughs> uh, I hope I'm going to convince you why. Um, they are poor, very, very poor source of protein, and not only the levels are low, but also their quality is low. So what does it mean that the quality is low? Uh, when we look at the amino acid composition in, for example, in some of the cereals, in the most type of crop, they're actually insufficient to meet our dietary requirements. So this is a table of the essential amino acid. Yeah, in wheat, rice, and maize, and the units here are fold in increased to get our required dietary allowance if we eat one boiled kilogram per day. So I'm going to translate it, and in red, those are area of concern. Let me translate what we're seeing here. So if a healthy person wants to stay healthy, he will need to eat eight kilograms of wheat or corn per day to stay healthy if he doesn't eat any dairy or uh, meat. And that does happen. And also, we need to understand that our livestock is eating corn, right? Um, so that's, we can work on that. So let's try to understand the mechanics of what we're seeing. So here are our dietary protein. When we eat, we hydrolyze them to their um, free amino acid pool, and then we assemble our own body protein. So let's imagine that we don't have this yellow brick uh, enough to build our own body protein, so we need to eat more and more, of course, excrete, excrete more and more in order to gain what we need. So these are where these numbers are coming from. So here, if we can rebalance the dietary protein that we eat and get corn to be in the composition of a steak, uh, we will be able to eat far less, right? Because no matter how much you love croissant, this is kind of excessive. Um, so. <laughs> I will briefly go over what people have tried to do. So this was uh, a problem that have been addressed uh, by B Brian Larkins and since then, and there are a lot of problems to improve that composition. And this is where I hope my lab comes in. But before I'm gonna let you see a little bit about what we're doing, I want to introduce you to the two functional amino acid pool in the seed. So we have 5% free amino acid, it's a very small pool. But it's very important pool because the free amino acids are basically the precursor for protein. But they're also the precursor of, of many other metabolic processes like glycolysis, they can function as osmolite, TCA cycle, they can go into secondary metabolites. So they're very important. And then the remaining 95% of the total amino acid in the seeds are actually deposited in the protein. So FAA will be free amino acid from now on, PBAA, protein bound amino acid. So we have 95, around 95% in the protein bound amino acid, depends on the species. And up to 70% should be deposited in what we call seed storage proteins. And those are actually the main culprit because those seed storage proteins are very poor in those essential amino acids. Um, and again, I don't think I mentioned those essential amino acids are amino acids that we have to take from our diet and we cannot synthesize in our body. Um, so the storage protein are really very highly abundant, but they are very poor in essential amino acid. So we have a way out, right? So researcher, what 
basically researchers have thought about is we can knock those all out, right? They're very problematic. Let's just get rid of them, brute force. Uh, but it appeared to be that when we do that and we knock them all out, even though they can represent a major chunk of the proteomic sink, we actually see very little change in the total amino acid composition in the sea. What we have, what they have shown that we have free amino acid reprogramming, and even more importantly, what we call protein bound amino acid rebalancing. So it turns out that all these amino acids are just going elsewhere and we do not get um, what we want in terms of nutritional quality. <coughs> so another approach is just to uh, insert high quality protein. But it turns out that this caused the same phenomena, this protein bound amino acid rebalancing. How this rebalancing is actually, what is the mechanism is actually not known. Why is it even there? It is not known. We can postulate, um, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. So finally, another approach that people have been trying to do is, all right, if free amino acids are the precursor for protein, if we're gonna fuss around with those, maybe we can change the protein and the output of the dry seed. But that turned out to be also not super successful. We can uh, increase the level of protein by increasing um, the free amino acid flow into the protein, but mostly we cannot change a lot uh, regarding the composition. Actually, the only amino acid that if you increase can change some of the protein composition is methionine. So, and this is where kind of, I think my lab is coming in. So the conclusion is that we don't know a lot and in order to improve nutritional quality in sense of amino acid bound fortification, we really need to go back to the stretching board and understand really basic um, question about basically regulation. So in my lab, we're focusing on two uh, main questions. How do plants regulate amino acid level and composition? We will see that those are actually disconnected um, and how do they control uh, seed amino acid composition in response to abiotic stress. So regulation is when everything is going right, controlling when everything is going wrong. Um, so I hope time will allow. I will uh, show you today, um, first of all, kind of to uh, do some basic, under to uh, increase our basic understanding, what is the effect of water stress on these traits in dry Arabidopsis. And again, uh, we're doing that because we think it's very translatable. This rebalancing mechanism is happening in corn, in soybean, in Arabidopsis. Almost every species that we look at is doing this rebalancing mechanism. And then I'm gonna talk about how we harness natural variation in order to get to the bottom of the genetic basis of this trait, and then trying to figure out if the interplay between free and bound amino acids can teach us even more about um, how we can go about biofortification of these traits. But before we start, every experiment uh, today nowadays is very extensive. So we needed a high throughput analysis. So fortunately, as was mentioned, I'm coming from Dean de la Fena's lab. So there, during my postdoc, I further developed a method that is based on LCMSMS MRM, multiple reaction monitoring approach, uh, basically targeted um, approach to detect 20 proteogenic amino acid. This method was established by the Dan Jones lab and the Rob Lass lab, and I further developed that during my postdoc. What's really great about that is that we can measure absolute levels, uh, very short time span with great resolution. I know there are NIR methods there, but they're not really sufficient to um, look at very small changes or natural variation changes. For some amino acids, they are. For some, they are not. Um, and it's all in 96 phase setup and the uh, peak are semi-automatic uh, integration. So you can see here the total ion count, and when we look at the channel, you can see that we can really resolve beautifully um, those free amino acids. So great, we have an affordable, which is the key point here, uh, and really short uh, method to check our free amino acid, but the problem that we did not have it for protein bound amino acid, and that's, I think, one of the problems that really impeded the field that we cannot apply a lot of genomic uh, analysis on um, association panel 
in order, and in order to do that, we had to have a very simple method. So we thought, great, that's very simple. We're just going to mush uh, HCL hydrolysis that is, has been there forever with our free amino acid analysis and get our protein bound amino acid high protein method. Wrong. Uh, Abu Yobi had to work about a year to actually make it happen, but we finally succeeded. And now we have what we call a micro scale HCL hydrolysis. We actually need only two to three milligram in order to uh, uh, detect 15 protein bound amino acid that represents 17. So glutamine and um, asparagine is going to glutamate and aspartate. This is where this is coming from. And some with gurus. But we do want high throughput method. It's all in a 96 plate uh, setup, and it is compatible with our free amino acid analysis. So now we have a very affordable way to look at those traits in however um, we want. Again, the previous ways are, were either lengthy, expensive, or needed a lot of materials. Um, and working with both Arabidopsis and maize or some mutants that we are, don't have a lot of um, sample for, was kind of a problem. So this is actually um, published in current protocol in plant biology, if you're interested in this method. So now we decided to start with something super simple, just to look at the effect of water stress on both free and bound amino acid. And we also wanted to look whether intensity or duration uh, influence this response. So what we do know is that free amino acid in the vegetative tissue is elevated when stress is applied. And this is because they can function as osmolite or they can uh, be, it can be the result of protein turnover. Um, we also know from wheat studies that uh, the proteomic uh, composition is changing when there are drought uh, periods. Um, however, we don't know if this rebalancing mechanism is happening or not. So in order to uh, start kind of teasing apart what's going on there. Um, Dr. Abuyobi and Clemente Gaza set up two sets of experiments, one water limitation and the other water deprivation. And we were interested in understanding what's happening during food settings. So all our treatments began one week after bolting. Um, so in the water limitation, we had 100% pot capacity, 75, 50, 25, and 10 pot capacity. And in our water deprivation, basically those are prolonged drought treatments, we uh, had Again, from one week after bolting, uh, we irrigated for one week, two weeks, three weeks, all the way to six weeks, which is the entire duration of our seed setting in our growth conditions. And uh, when we look, I don't show it, but when we look at the relative water content in the soil, we see that uh, we're reaching our targeted um, capacity very quickly as well when we are applying water deprivation and the least water content is kind of a week after. All right, so before we are going to talk about the free and the bound amino acid, uh, we just, first of all, uh, went and looked a little bit about the key physiological traits that are going to be super relevant. So we looked at seed yield and we looked at seed weight. So in water limitation, no surprise there, we lost a lot of yield, up to 70%, and it started all the way from 50% pot capacity. Um, in water limitation, when we looked at actually seed weight, we actually see an increase. So milder water stress treating Arabidopsis um, actually caused, again, from 50% pot capacity, an increase in seed weight and decrease in seed yield. When we look at water deprivation, we are seeing a much larger reduction in <coughs> seed yield, up to 90%, um, and we see a reduction in the seed weight. So at least in Arabidopsis, and I know that it's not only in Arabidopsis, uh, we have a plastic response of the seed weight to the severity of the water stress. But again, what we were really interested in is trying to understand what's happening for, in our, for our free and bound amino acid. So first I'm going to show you the total free amino acid and the total bound amino acid. So in water limitation, what we have seen is that from 25% and on, free amino acid went up. And um, they were pretty much coordinated with what happened in the total bound amino acid. So again, from 25 and 10% up. But remember, oh, well, I need to mention that. So we are normalizing per seed, right? We are interested in per biological unit. 
So this is mostly due to increasing seed size. What we're looking here is the water deprivation. You can see that from basically three weeks, so three weeks of water deprivation, we have a very large change in our free amino acid. They just jump. Um, so it's kind of showing some sort of metabolic switch. And when we look at the total bound amino acid, nothing really happens. But I just told you those seeds are really reducing about 23% of their weight. So we went and looked at the seed nitrogen and seed carbon to understand what's going on. So in water limitation, we can see really that just in the 10%, we have elevation of carbon and nitrogen. So the 25% was mostly due to seed size. And in water deprivation, and this is unit of percentages, we have increase in nitrogen, but we don't really have increase in protein-bound amino acid. We're just getting smaller seeds. So this condensation effect is due to the fact that protein-bound amino acid is staying constant while seeds are decreasing. Uh, so why they're decreasing? Because the percentage of carbon remain the same. When we look at the absolute level, it is reducing. So very different metabolic uh, responses um, that are giving uh, essentially the same effect. Increase in the nitrogen in both water deprivation and limitation, but the underlying molecular mechanism are different. So we wanted to see if individual amino acids are actually making any contrib specific contribution. Again, looking at the water limitation, and this is in fold increase and fold decrease. We first want to look at the absolute level, and then we're going to look at the composition, which is the relative composition. Uh, we can see that here, um, these are the free amino acid. They're kind of mostly elevated um, in coordinates, all of them in coordinates with our water deprivation, with our water treatment. But when we look at water deprivation, we can see that not all of them are kind of <coughs> the same thing, but uh, very specific amino acids are going up. And this is really consistent with what we're seeing in the um, vegetative tissue and also alludes to the fact that here we have an osmotic adjustment that we do not have when we do water limitation. Even though water limitation is severe, it's 10% cost capacity, the entire duration of the seed setting. Um, so then one other thing we wanted to look is uh, their relative composition, because it seems that relative composition is going to play an important part, at least from the plant perspective. So when we look at water limitation, um, these guys are bigger. We have more nitrogen, we have more carbon, but their relative composition is actually almost intact. There are a little bit of change, but really it's the same. So again, this is in percentages. This is now the relative composition. When we look at water deprivation, we still see that there is a change in the composition. So there is this osmotic adjustment that is um, also changing, basically reprogramming of free amino acid accumulation in seeds, in dry seed. All these measurements are in dry seed. So then we go to the protein bound amino acid. And again, let's look first on the absolute level. We see the same thing that we've seen in the free amino acid. They're all kind of going up. Again, those are per seed, so most of it is basically increased in the seed size. But really, again, interestingly, there is a trend of reduction in the protein-bound amino acid, but it's largely not significant. So when we look at the composition, in both treatments, the composition is staying almost intact. But again, uh, it's staying intact, but the underlying mechanism that's going on there is actually really different. Um, again, this water deprivation uh, plants are really miserable. So how can we get the same composition? Um, and again, here seed sizing is increasing, here seed size is decreasing, what's going on there? So in order to start to answer this question, we did a short <coughs> on two of the extreme treatments. Um, in water deprivation and water limitation. And what we discovered that when we look at the water limitation severe treatment, there is no significant change when we um, compare equal amount of protein between uh, the control and our treatment. Again, alluding that the acclimation basically uh, went all the way to the protein. So we have just bigger seeds and we have more of what we had before. But when we look at the water deprivation, 
that we don't see any change in the level of protein bound amino acid. We actually see that 576 protein not genes um, um, were significantly altered. Actually, 541 increased, while only 35 decreased. So that was interesting because, again, the overall, we see that nothing had changed. So when we look at the GO enrichment analysis of what are the proteins that are changing, uh, there is no surprise there. They're mostly regarding uh, biosynthetic processes or processes related to this really very intense water stress that we are imposing on them. But what was really interesting was what was decreasing. And what was decreasing is actually those highly abundant storage proteins, all three storage protein that uh, we know of from Arabidopsis were actually going significantly down. And that was probably enough, at least from our data, to counteract this increase. So I think if we can conclude what we're seeing from this first part is that we are seeing um, proteomic rebalancing under water stress. And we are hypothesizing that this is the origin of this rebalancing rebalancing mechanism to begin with, providing that what we've seen that the protein amino acid composition is actually really rigorously maintained. So the conclusion from here, uh, we're really profound in order for us to go and start doing genomic data, uh, with genomic studies uh, and genomic research approaches, because we can see that, first of all, free and bound amino acid levels uh, and composition do depend on stress imposition. But that's not a surprise. We also see that the composition and the level are really regulated differently. So we can get different uh, things and they will be not overlapping in terms of efficiencies in their metabolic regulation. And that protein amino acid composition is rigorously maintained, but under different molecular mechanism in those uh, slightly different, well, not slightly, in those different water imposition. And lastly, that free amino acids seems to be very plastic adaptable traits, and this is consistent with what we know of them, and the protein bound amino acid, which again, I remind you, are the products of the free amino acid, right? Are really extremely robust traits that uh, is very hard to protrude. Um, so it seems that all is lost, but not really, because when we look at natural variation, we do have natural variation in these traits. So it means that we have a set point for those compositional traits. And that set point is changed somehow throughout evolution. Um, so I'm going to show you some of this data. Um, and we're going we're gonna to look at maize first and then maybe jump back if we have time to our abidopsis to see what are some of those um, genetic bases potentially can be, and also talk about the uh, interaction between free and bound amino acids. Um, so here in this crowd, I don't need to um, tell you what is the Goodman diversity panel. So Vivek Shrestha took the corn diversity panel. Sherry Flynn Garcia was gracious to give us uh, 207 line that she grew. Um, and first of all, we wanted to understand what is the natural variation of this trait. Um, and as you can see, free amino acids are really much more variable than protein bound amino acid. And again, this is consistent with what we're seeing, but we also are seeing that there is natural variation in the levels. Um, so it means, again, that this set point is probably the one that is shifting. Um, when one of the other questions we wanted to uh, address is whether, um, so we looked at water stress, but throughout natural variation, whether there is any coordination between free and bound amino acid. So we did network correlation analysis, and we didn't enforce those clusters. So we had protein-bound amino acid really clustering uh, separately from the free amino acid, consistent with their actually different function uh, that we just seen in the water stress uh, imposition. So one of the, okay, before that. So one of the other thing we wanted to do is, of course, look at the gene and the genetic architecture or the genetic basis using genome-wide association mapping and see if we get any, any clues about 
the interplay between them. And again, it is important because remember that people have thought that it will bring more free amino acids will actually affect the mm -hmm. proteins. And what we are seeing is actually um, that when in this specific panel with this specific power that there is no overlap between the candidate gene. And this is using um, GWAS, we use farm CPU kind of, I wouldn't say lax, but I think it's uh, not as rigorous. Uh, we use 5% Bonferroni all the way to 20% Bonferroni. And we not only use the absolute level of our trait, because I just shown you that their level and their composition might be regulated differently. So we actually calculate 137 free amino acid traits from their relative composition and from biochemical uh, ratio that we know of and 106 protein bound uh, amino acid um, traits. Again, based on our biochemical knowledge. And we have taken, um, 100 KB from each side to deduce candidate genes, and still we didn't get any overlap between them, consistent with the fact that they have different function. But again, this is surprising because they are um, basically precursor and product. I'm not gonna go very deep into the, the genes that, that underlying this, but what we don't see well, let's start with what we do see. We see when we look at free amino acid genes that are um, involved in translation, energy, and degradation. And when we look at the protein bound GWAS, and this is still work that is ongoing, um, genes that are um, related to ribosomal, protein, vacuolar sorting, and energy. Um, so if we kind of conclude what we're seeing from this part is that, um, it seems that the genetic bases and the regulation of those traits do not overlap. So that, again, if we translate it to breeding, that's super important because we can take some approaches and not take others. And another thing, and that is alluding to what we don't see, we did not see genes that are um, related to their metabolic pathway. And one would say that we don't have really the power, but at least we can say that they are not strongly regulated by their metabolic power, metabolic pathways. And then in the protein bound amino acids, we don't see storage protein coming up and you would expect that they would come up. But again, that's not the case. And this is very consistent with what we just see, seen with the water stress. Um, so one also can say that we're looking at the, um, not the appropriate time point because we look at dry amino acids, right? So we wanted to make sure we're doing the right thing and we went and looked at um, the development of the seed and we, <coughs> so here we went and looked from basically the maturation all the way to um, the dry seeds. We looked at Ohio 43 and you can see seed, uh, average seed weight is going up. And then these are the total bound amino acids, they're going up while the free amino acid is really kind of flatlining here like a dead patient. Uh, and we are not really sure why it's going on. Um, so when we looked at the individual amino acid, we can see this really coordinated upregulation of their levels while free amino acid in two separate lines, Ohio 43 and B73, they're really just doing what the heck they want over here. Um, again, consistent with the, uh, probably their function. Um, so I think I have 10 minutes left. So I, oh, sorry. So I would use it to try to answer the question, the following question of what the heck, what are they doing and what can they be regulated uh, by? Um, and one thing I do want to add that the free amino acid in the dry seed are actually very important for germination. We have, I've shown in my PhD that they are consumed very rapidly during early germination. So it's not, uh, useless question in terms of agronomical traits, right? So we're gonna jump really quickly back to our Abidopsis and try to see if we can understand what is regulate, what potentially can regulate that, those traits. So Marianne Emery and Yan Chen on in my lab have done a really neat um, experiment looking at the free glutamine in the dry seed in a Abidopsis. So we used a 300 line association panel. We had three reps. Um, 
And what we've done here is actually take what we call a semi-combinatorial approach. We took free glutamine and derived all the ratios for its metabolic family, which is the glutamate family that is comprised of proline, glutamine, glutamate. Histidine is usually uh, not always included. We put it in anyway, and arginine. We got 32 traits, but they're all derivative traits of free glutamine in the dry seed. And what was nice that usually we didn't get any hits on absolute level of glutamine or even the relative composition of free glutamine. And now we got plenty of hits. So one of the things that we wanted to ask is whether we can associate it with any other metabolic process uh, in order to do that. And we took kind of a rigorous um, cutoff. We did haploblock analysis, and then we extracted all the genes within the haploblock of those SNPs that we're seeing for all these traits. And then we did a go enrichment analysis. And to our pleasant surprise, we actually found that uh, we had an enrichment of the glucosinolate pathway. The glucosinolate pathway is a secondary metabolic pathway that is um, actually unique to Brassica um, and its anti herbivory um, pathway. And another thing is that. Uh, those free haploblock with those three genes, AOP1, 3, and MUM1, are actually known QTL that um, have been studied quite thoroughly in the glucosinolate pathway. They are called the GS along and the GS AOP. What was not so discouraging is that the glucosinolates are not related to free glutamine. What, what are we seeing here? Actually, the aliphatic glucosinolate um, that the genes that we had hits on came from is starting from methionine. The indole glucosinolate is starting from tryptophan, and the aromatic glucosinolate is starting from phenylalanine. Um, so what is happening here, we're not sure, but as a really good uh, researcher, we started knocking out all the genes that has to do uh, with glucosinolate. And in that region, I don't have time to show you, but we have three more glucosinolate genes that are in very strong LD with our SNPs. So we did those as well. Uh, making long story short, we got really nothing. We were super discouraged. Um, we were also very discouraged because when we did QTL analysis on our traits in population that we knew segregated on those QTLs, we've seen, and this is just an example, uh, we actually seen the recapitulation of our GWAS trait. So what happened, what is happening there? Of course, I wouldn't have told you that if I had nothing. So <laughs> it's obvious, right? <laughs> we, are, we are getting to a point here. Uh, so what we decided to do is we, we decided that we thought that our GWAS and our QTL analysis is firm. So how about we are going to downregulate the entire pathway? And we can do that by actually knocking out those transcription factors that is regulating this pathway. And those are called MIP29 and MIP28. And for, as a control, we also looked at double knockout of MIP34 and 51. Um, and this is controlling the uh, indole glucosinolate. Ta-da! Sorry, I have to say it all this, every time I show this slide because it's my favorite slide. Um, what we've seen is actually something really neat. So the MIP2829, we got a hundredfold increase specifically in free glutamine, which uh, I know you're not in the free amino acid business, but I have been doing this for 10 years and this is a lot. So we were very, very pleased. And also it's very, very specific. So there are elevation of other free amino acids, but this is very specific. When we look at the MIP3451, it's actually, you can see that nothing is happening. So that was really great. But then one day I was showing that and Mark Stitt came and say, well, all of it is pleiotropic. So I had to address that problem, right? So we got the GTR12 double mutant, which is actually transporter of glucosinolate into the seed. Glucosinolate is actually not synthesized in the seeds. It's synthesized in the leaves and in the silix, and then it enters the seeds. And what we've got is this beautiful uh, green line. We also got 30-fold increase uh, when we did that control. So it seems that there's something very specific here that is caused by the lack of the glucosinolate 
in the seed. And I don't have the slide to show it, but we again turned to proteomics to try to understand even a little bit more on what's happening there. We thought, oh, glutamine is very important for nitrogen. Maybe all the amino total amino acid is going down, uh, but that really did not happen. But what did happen, so again, this is balancing mechanism coming up again. But what did happen that we got one of the most highly abundant storage protein went down by half. So one of our hypotheses, we have two ongoing hypotheses that um, storage protein are really high in glutamine and proline in Arabidopsis. So maybe the lack of incorporation um, to that is causing this high uh, glutamine. Um, again, this is just an hypothesis. So why all the rest of them are not going as much is not clear. Another hypothesis is maybe the glutamine. So glucosinolate could be also a nitrogen source. So maybe the glutamine is replacing the glucosinolate that are not there. Uh, we don't know. We're still pursuing that. But I hope I convince you that um, there is a connection, a metabolic connection that we attain by doing CWAS uh, between, very specifically, between free glutamine in the dry seed, secondary metabolites, and the storage protein. So why is that interesting? Again, when we are thinking again about breathing, uh, maybe those connections between secondary, primary, and all the protein could play a very important role in that. Um, so that is the conclusion of part one. And I know we didn't answer those questions, but I hope I convinced you that we are trying to understand better the system. And maybe what we're going to uh, attain is um, things that we didn't expect. So a lot of people had done candidate gene approach. And what we're actually seeing from our view was that, at least in natural variation, we don't see the enzymes coming up as regulators. And maybe what we will see as regulator has to do with secondary metabolism. I know people think of secondary metabolism as a dead end. But those secondary metabolites need to come back to form metabolism somehow, right? Nobody, well, not nobody, but not a lot of people are addressing this loop. So maybe through some of those genomic studies, we can, we can look at that. All right. So just acknowledging people that have done a lot of the work. Of course, everybody in my lab, and I introduced them, and we have some undergrad that are doing a wonderful job. Sherry, that gave us the um, May seed. Dan Klippenstein and Hussein Hassam Nur al gave us those double mutants. Um, and of course, everybody else that we are collaborating with. Um, and thank you for listening. Then through, so you have time. So now you have to ask questions. I thought we have a graduate student ask a question for starting. <laughs> so the first part of the book, when you were looking on your data, it was like 50 percent increase uh, in the expression of genes relevant to nutrient amino acids, but it's proteomic data. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote genes, but uh, no, it's sorry. It was proteomic data. We did a shotgun proteomic. Sorry about that. Uh, so we actually looked at the protein because what we wanted to see is where are those amino acids are incorporated. Yeah, I need to uh, do that. So this is why we're claiming uh, this rebalancing because this is really what's integrating into those proteins themselves that is making up the amino acid composition. I'm just curious about the still. I'm still coming back to the nutrients. Sure, sure. Whether among those where proteins are relevant to mineral nutrients, so whether you mineral nutrients. Oh, mineral. See, we didn't. So when we did the enrichment, we didn't see anything about mineral nutrients. And kind of thinking about that, there are only 35 of them. So uh, I don't remember seeing any mineral related. But we can look a little bit more into the data. They're certainly not enriched. Um, in the one that increased, they're all over the place, but really the, the imprint there is stress response. Um, but maybe including in those increases are actually those proteins that need to, again, do this rebalancing mechanism. Because as I said, storage protein, they really lack in some 
uh, essential amino acids. So I, I think there is a different, there is a interplay there. And I think what, another thing that I forgot to mention, so what I think my lab is gonna try to get at is what is the natural variation of the rebalancing mechanism? I think we have looked a lot about the levels of amino acid, but what we really want to look at is the set point. And, and I have been talking to people and trying to gather ideas is how we can mathematically represent that set point in a good way. So one way is doing multivariate GWAS or using PCs and maybe doing machine learning on PCs all the way to 30. We are not, we don't really know, but we're trying to figure that out. Um, I didn't show you. Um, we did some genomic prediction analysis. And again, this is something in the works. We have consistent data that show that actually um, the metabolic pathways uh, are not increasing our prediction for our free amino acid data. And other metabolic pathways are actually increasing our predictive accuracy. Um, again, this is not the work that is done, so I didn't want to show it. Um, so multiple ways we're seeing the same thing. Um, and we'll try to develop the prediction approach maybe to inform us a little bit more about how to look at this set point. But right now we're, we're trying a lot of things. That's that's great question. So in Leeds, the MIB twenty. So in MIB, uh, they did. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the question was, um, do we really think there is a direct interaction between those? transcription factor, MIP28 and 29 on uh, glutamine metabolism. Um, so we looked, when we did this proteomic analysis, we looked at enzymes level that has to do with uh, glutamine. Um, we are actually seeing increase in the MIP28, 29, but we're not seeing an increase in the GTR12 mutants. So I think it is not glutamine metabolism. And because I don't think that those mutations can actually alter the enzyme function, I don't think that is glutamine metabolism. Um, but we can, we certainly need to check that. I do think that what is happening is uh, some, some source is kind of um, opening up and glutamine is replenishing that. Either is that, I think what is really, really surprising for me was that only one of the three highly abundant storage protein very specifically was reduced. So one thing we might think of is trying to get a direct interaction between, um, again, those MIBs and the storage protein. But then it leaves us again with a transporter. The MIBs are fine and we still don't see that protein. So it, it almost seemed that the, the presence of the glucosinolate is affecting very specifically a storage protein that is super abundant. Uh, if you guys have any idea what that mechanism could be, that's definitely the second step we're, we're gonna look at. Um, very puzzling, but I think very exciting because not a lot of people think about it like that, or because we didn't see that. No. So uh, since the storage proteins were in the seed, have you looked at the which one, the MIBs or? The water, the water oh. Right, there, there is no change in their germination. We didn't see, look at seedling establishment. I can say that we know that bigger seeds are better seeds, but usually uh, we are doing this germinate. We did preliminary analysis, we didn't see anything. We're now doing a much more revised. Also because we know that some elevation of free amino acid can actually impede germination, but that is not happening. This is why in the water deprivation, only specific free amino acids are increasing, and those are probably the ones that are not affecting, uh, that does, do not have deleterious effect on metabolism. Um, and again, I think, I started to say it, but I, I, I don't, maybe my thread of thought was uh, um, disturbed, but 
what I think is really important from this water stress analysis is that now we have another tool to look at rebalancing. We can just do multiple stresses, right? And what will happen, this is my hypothesis, is those, that re this rebalancing will happen in different shapes and form. And then if we compare all those stresses, we might finally capture what is in the source of this mechanism. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, one of the big things that I am taking away from this water stress experiment. Uh, within your base diversity panel, did you find any patterns of uh, amino acid composition between tropical and temperate or different lines? So actually, the answer is mostly no. No, uh, we didn't. See. So this is for the bound or the free? Because right, they're, they're <laughs> different. In terms of the bound um, and the free, we, we did not find a lot of structure there. Uh, we did do that analysis, and it seems that everything is kind of everywhere. Um, we probably need to go back to that, but it's not strongly affecting those traits. That, that's what I can definitely say. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned the amount of samples that's required for this uh, more accurate uh, measurement of amino acid composition. Is it a fresh tissue or some kind of fraction? So we. Um, that method was developed for seeds, so th those are dry tissue, but we are using that also for, we actually measured um, almost uh, at least five types of seed. We did sorghum, we did um, soybean. So in that protocol, we did many of them, but we can also do um, fresh tissue, but we, we, we are, we think the offalizing the fresh tissue is much better because then you can normalize it for dry seed, for dry matter. And I think that's a more accurate way to look at things. Um, but it's um, very simple. And I think, again, I do believe this is, was in pending the field for a very long time. I know industry could have done that, do HPLC that is lengthy and uh, they have a lot of the information. But I think now we can do a lot of it. We can run thousands of samples in a relatively reasonable cost. Um, and, and hopefully, a lot of discoveries are going to come out of that. Okay, we're at 110. I would like to say that Ruthie has some availability this afternoon, and she's not leaving until tomorrow afternoon, so she may have some free time, but you have a chance to stay this afternoon. So let's thank her once again. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.